Okay, so we're moving on into First Corinthians chapter 13, but we are in the custom of doing, we're not wanting to forget where it is that we are coming from. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. You would go up to chapter 12, <laughs> dealing with the disruption that's been produced because of the spiritual gifts. We are finding out that the reason why they're doing that is connected with everything that we've already discussed. There are these divisions. Uh, there's pride that is being found within the church here at Corinth. And what we get into here in chapter 13, which has already been touched on a little bit in another chapter, I'll ask you about that uh, in just a moment, we're going to find the key ingredient in overcoming division. Now, that's division. That is what we're dealing with the religious world through denominationalism. But when we're considering this information as it's written first and foremost inside of its context, what kind of division are we talking about? Between brethren. All right. This is division that's happening inside of a local congregation. So when we're looking at even going back to First Corinthians chapter one and verse ten, we're talking about be no divisions, be of the same mind, speaking the same thing. Where is that application? Right. All right, that's with the church. Now, when we look at it, I mean, and certainly it does have that wide application. And many times when people go to that passage, that's what they want. To do. <laughs> this is a denominationalism. That's not what Paul is writing about because there are no denominations at this time. He is just focusing on these brethren at this congregation. So this uh, this chapter, as we said, to make a mention, has a general, a wide application. But there is a specific application that is found to this church at Corinth and in dealing with their problems. Now, when we're looking at it from that standpoint, we then are going to be able to take some key information as to how it is that we're going to be able to remove some of our problems. When they arise, divisions, as they're going to happen. Here's what is going to be at the forefront of that. So as we said, a major problem in producing uh, the divisions was because of pride. Now in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, Paul uses a specific word to describe them. Schism. Not quite. That is in there. But he says, I can't speak to you as this, but I need to speak to you as this. Babe. All right. Is that what you're going for? Well, he says that he's going to speak to them as babes, and why is that? Because you're not blank. Um, mature. Start with C. Carnal. All right. Mm-hmm. Carnality. Fleshliness. Now, as we are here in chapter 13, we're going to get to the cure for that. Now, chapter 12, verse 31, Paul closes that section as he's dealing with all this division about these people clamoring and arguing over these different miraculous gifts. And he closes that section by saying, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Right here, we have Paul getting into the reality as to what is going to happen with the miraculous gifts. They have these things. And within this section of chapter 12 of the spiritual gifts, and where he's saying, <laughs> kind of the gifts, what does he say that one of those is going to be? Well, he hasn't said it in this chapter, but he's going to say it in chapter 14, but he's already hinted at it in this section. They're all caught up in speaking in tongues, but then he's going to give preeminence, if we can use that word, to another gift. Love. Instead of speaking in tongues, they need to be doing this. Paul is going to put the emphasis on prophecy. Instead of speaking in tongues, you should prophesy. And that's because prophecy just simply means teaching, and that's what's involved in edification. So within that, in saying covenant earnestly the best gifts, all right, we have some that are, in fact, better than others, if we can put it that way, and they'll all play a part. But now he's transitioning, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And this is what is superior above the miraculous gifts altogether. And that is what he enters into in this chapter, chapter 13, with... Charity or love. 
Because when the gifts are gone, what are we going to be left with? All we're going to be left with is God's word, and we better have a love for God's word and a love for one another if we're going to keep this thing you know, moving forward. So this is a contrast between the temporary, which is the miraculous, and that which is permanent, the more excellent way. And that's what he's going to touch on as he gets towards the end of chapter 13, which we're not going to get to that today. But as we, so just going back and looking at these different things, as we're saying the causes as to what's gotten us here. First Kings chapter 1, verse 12, Now this is say that every one of you said, I am the prophet, I am the prophet, I am Cephas, and I have Christ, the dividing up underneath all these different teachers. The cause, as we said, was carnality. Now we're going to be looking at the cure, chapter 4, 5, and 8. We have the phrase being used, how that uh, these individuals are puffed up. And it's against all of this, that this chapter, these things here are the background as to why we now have chapter 13. Now, this subject matter that we have in chapter 13 has already been mentioned in chapter 8. <clears throat> All there makes a contrast between one element and another element. He says something does one thing and this other element does another. And it's the same topic that we're on here in chapter 13. He's talking about eating of meats, offered to idols, and he starts talking about two classes of people. Some that have something and some that don't. Knowledge. All right, knowledge. Some have knowledge that this idol is nothing while others are struggling with it. Now, what does he say is the danger of knowledge? All right, knowledge puffs up, but what, uh, what kind of evens that out? All right, charity edifying it. So way back in chapter 8, Paul has already set the foundation for where he's moving into chapter 13. So as we read, uh, read these situations, we read these chapters, what you do with division, then this is where it starts. Now, this is important because many people think, well, just as long as we have everything in line doctrinally, then we're going to be okay. You know, we have everything down doctrinally when it comes to our worship, you know, our assemblies and how we worship. We're following the book on that. We have it you know, down the line when it comes to the plan of salvation. All right, if we have all these things, then we're going to have unity. Is that really the case? No. Because you can have all those things in line and still have disunity. And it's because of what Paul's going to mention here in chapter 13. If you don't have care and love for one another, then what good are having all these points of doctrine together? And that ultimately is what Paul's going to end up saying. Though I speak with tongues and I don't have charity, what? I'm just making a noise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't profit anybody. And so when we are considering, uh, you know, also in that line, the idea that many brethren will quote 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, there could be no division, speaking the same thing, being the same mind, same judgment. <laughs> Okay, that if we just have all that, then everything's going to be fine. But we see that's not the case. I mean, to a large degree, when it comes to, you know, the brethren that are here that we had to withdraw from, they have many things together doctrinally. And when it comes to the plan of salvation, they teach what the Bible teaches. So why is there division? No love. No love. The very thing that we're going to be discussing in this chapter that Paul is going to emphasize that you may have all these other things and do all these <laughs> wonderful things, but if you don't have love one for another, then it's not going to be any type of advantage to you. So how is this to be done? What's the cure? As we said, it's put, uh, it's presented to us this way throughout this chapter. Now just consider Luke chapter 22 and verse 24. And then also connecting John chapter 13, which is going to be the same situation. It's the same event given from two different perspectives. This is the feast of Passover before Jesus is to be crucified, Jesus with his disciples, his apostles. Luke gives us the information by revelation in Luke 22, 24, that there was also strife among the apostles during this time frame. Here they are, about to partake the Lord's, or not the Lord's Supper, but the Passover, which Jesus is going to institute as being the Lord's Supper. And this right before Jesus is about to die before the, uh, for the sins of the entire world. And their strife with them. What's it over? Which of them should be accounted the greatest? 
So it's the very same problem that we have here at Corinth. Here are men trying to gun for a position. Well, who's better? Who's stronger? Who's going to be, you know, who's going to lead? And the way that Jesus goes through to illustrate what is actually going to help keep them together is none of this but what we have here in John 13, 34. After Jesus washes their feet, and then he gives them a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, and I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So in the midst of all this, the new command, which is, this is not a new command. Now, the Old Testament taught them that they're supposed to have love for one another, and that they're supposed to love their neighbor. The problem is, is just how easy it is for us to forget this. That when problems arise, and when there is division, that we no longer view each other in this aspect, we all, all of a sudden become enemies. And that's where that pride comes in. But Jesus is removing that in this situation by giving them that illustration. You need to serve each other. Well, why would you do that? Well, because I care about you. And if we have this care for one another, then the things that we're doing doctrinally, the things that we're involved in with our worship assembly, it's going to be more meaningful to us. <laughs> So the missing ingredient that we have inside of Corinth is this element of love. Now, it's the same thing that's missing through a large portion of our brotherhood. And part of it's because they have a misconception of what biblical love actually involves, just like the denominational world does. And we'll deal with that a little bit more in our next, um, our next hour in looking at our sermon together. So here's the gospel accounts. Now, let's go towards the end of what we have uh, laid out in our Bible. First John. Notice in First John chapter 3 and then moving on into chapter 4. All of the emphasis that's being placed upon this ingredient that Paul is talking about in this chapter. First John 3, 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So when we're considering just how important this element is, this is a uh, distinction, a mark of distinction between us and everybody else. That if we love our brethren, then okay, we realize we've been saved. But if we don't have this, then what? You, you're still dead where you stand. So how many people are thinking, well, I've obeyed the gospel, I've had my sins washed away, but then they don't end up cultivating this. They don't end up growing in this. Your baptism did nothing for you. All that did was get you wet. You are not walking in the light, you're not being cleansed by the blood of Christ. Yes. Does that mean you have to be rebaptized at that point, or did you have an understanding at the beginning and you just aren't growing like Hebrews 5 and 6 talking about? It was dim situation in a person yeah because <clears throat> i mean there are plenty of people uh so while we were in tennessee one of the new things i had to see uh carrie while we were there and i don't know if this was a lady that he was talking to or if it was just a lady that he knew about but this one this one lady in bible study they were trying to have her obey the gospel come near the lord's church so on and so forth and she made the statement that well why can't uh, you know, why can't I be like the eunuch in Acts chapter 8 and not have to worry about being assembled with a local congregation? And they kind of looked at her funny. It's like, you know, what do you mean? And she said, well, it says that he was baptized and that for the mission of sins, but then he went on his way rejoicing. And you don't read about him, you know, being tagged to any, you know, any local body. Now, when I heard that, I like guess just really started laughing because that's pretty slick. You know, that's some quick thinking on your feet to come up with that, you know, that type of idea. But there are many people that have that idea that, well, I want to be saved, but I don't want to have to have any connection to a brotherhood. Well, then you don't probably understand what's going on here. And so when we're looking at that and we're considering from that standpoint, then yeah, somebody who's missing, you know, that point of application then it's just like, yeah, what you're, what you've received, what you've been taught, is not the truth. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who has an understanding, but like you were saying, just doesn't grow in it, 
then you know, that's going to be on you. Mm -hmm. That you're going to have to repent of that and try to grow in this area. So that's John 3, 14. Notice John 3, 16. Hereby perceived we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now here is an example of how this love is to be played out. God did this for us. Now, since he did this for us, what are we supposed to do in return? Lay down our lives for the brethren. How many brethren do you know would be willing to lay down their lives for you? I don't know many. And I would say that even throughout a large portion of the brotherhood, that when it came down to this, you're going to find very few that actually have this kind of understanding that this is the kind of bond that we're supposed to have. The bond that they think that's being presented to our scriptures when you come in on Sunday and then you go home, we don't see each other until next Sunday. That type of mentality and that type of activity does not produce this kind of bond. Now, people can say that they'll do this all day long, but just like with Peter, he said that he would die with Christ too. And when it came time, where was he? He was running and hiding with the rest of the apostles. Notice 1 John 4 and verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So we're just going through all this just to further emphasize how important this segment of Scripture is, 1 John 4 and 10 and 11. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought. Now, there's obligation. This is a responsibility that we have. We need to be doing this. We ought also to love one another. And then 1 John 4 and 16. We have known, excuse me, and we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. You cannot call yourself a Christian and not have this element and to have it to this kind of degree. So when we are considering what it is that Paul is presenting in this section, there is not a person in the Lord's church that does not need this type of application. Has anybody reached this level? The level of love that God has? No. No. Then guess what? That's something I'm always going to be looking for. <laughs> and with that reality that this is something that I'm always going to be working on, that keeps me at a humble level. It keeps me from reaching a position of thinking that, okay, I've arrived or that I've reached the top. No, there is still plenty of growth to go. Verses 19 through 21. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment, notice, so before we had the word ought, which is obligation, now we have this being spelled out as a commandment. This commandment have we from him that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Now, granted, are there some people inside of the brotherhood that I'm just not going to mesh with? Yeah, that is the case. I'm not going to get along with everybody in the same way. Personality types, just different uh, interests that people have. I just don't have interest in that. So guess what? We're probably not going to spend a whole lot of time together. But it still remains that you are my brother in Christ. And that even though we may not be the best of friends, we are still supposed to have this type of relationship. That if it ever came down to you being in need and having some type of want, then if I'm going to have the love that God had, then I'm going to help you out. Or if I find you in some type of sin, I'm going to come not with this idea that, you know, we're just looking for the sake of attack and that we're coming to destroy anybody. But then in coming in correction, it is the same type of attitude that a father would have for a son. 
that even though you and I are not necessarily the best of friends, I'm not going to come at you and just be ugly to you. And so as we look at all of that, moving us back to where we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul using this situation of the miraculous gifts and aligning that with the need to have love for one another. If they have love for one another, then what about all of these problems that they're having about miraculous gifts? It wouldn't be there. There wouldn't be any problems. Because you're realizing, I have this gift. It's not for my benefit, but it's for the benefit of others. So I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You align that with 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. <clears throat> the reason why we have these two going together is because though Paul is dealing with a different subject and he's attacking from a different angle in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the emphasis is still the same. If I just come in to an assembly, and here we all are, and we speak English, and I just came in to an assembly, and I just started preaching the entire class, the entire sermon in German. What is that? Not. Oh, that's not for edification, and that's not for your good. That's for me. I'm just doing that to show off. And what is that? That's a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. Nobody knows what that means. Nobody would even understand what these, what these sounds were inside of an assembly. So moving down here, or over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where you have it being said of a person coming in and speaking in an unknown tongue, notice it says, for no man understandeth him. So why would you do it? There'd be no reason to do it. And if I really love my brethren and have information that I want them to understand, then what am I going to do? Speak out language they can understand. I'm just going to speak in what you know. Now, we've already touched on this, but we'll go ahead and dig a little bit deeper on it. On how that's unfortunate the translators inserted in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 the word unknown. They should have just left that alone. For he that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. When we're considering these individuals speaking in tongues, speaking in languages, and even here where it says that I speak in the tongues of men, so right there we have a clarification as to what the tongues are. What is the unknown tongue? Well, it's still a tongue of men. It's still a language. It's just something that's unknown to me. It's unlearned. But even as we're dealing here and we're looking at the tongues of angels, how do we explain that? Because they'll run to this passage and they'll say, they'll, they'll point out, okay, see here, there's tongues of men and there's tongues of angels, and that's two different languages. Which I would argue that's not true. What's your question? How would we explain <laughs> that the tongues of angels is not a different dialect, but that it is the same thing as the tongues of men. The only thing I can think of is in former, former passages, whenever there's been a revelation by an angel, it's speaking in a language that men can understand. Okay, that's it. So just with that, that's not overthinking it. And some might view that argumentation as being super simple, but that is the point. Why would you want to make it super difficult? And that's exactly right. In other passages where you have an angel appearing to somebody and speaking to them, he is speaking to them in a language that they understand. Why would you make it difficult? Okay, God is going to send a messenger. And in sending the messenger, he's going to send him speaking in a language that these people aren't going to understand. So then I have to take an extra step and interpret that for these people so they can understand it. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So, like, for example, Luke chapter 1, verse 11, 13, 11 through 13, which, as Jane mentioned, there are plenty of other uh, passages where you can also go to. But I just wanted to go to this one because it is in the New Testament. And to him, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. 
When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, No need for interpretation. Now we know when interpretation is used in Scripture, do we not? Can you think of some passages where the Bible actually tells us where something is being interpreted? Think about the birth of Christ. Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 2. And there's something in there. And the Bible actually tells us that is interpreted. Matthew chapter 1, I think it be around 22 or 23. His name? There you go. His name shall be what? Yeah. Which is? All right, which is interpreted, God with us. <clears throat> so if something needs to be interpreted or translated over, guess what? The Bible will tell us. Mm -hmm. There is no mention of any type of translation or interpretation when an angel appears to a man and speaks to him. Another situation would be like with Daniel and the hand appears and is writing on the wall. What the hand wrote was not in some angelic tongue to where the king could not understand it. Who was in charge when Daniel was in captivity? Nebuchadnezzar. All right, which is what country? Babylon. All right, Babylon. Daniel is a what? All right, is a Jew or a Hebrew? So there you have two different languages. A Babylonian king is not going to understand what is being written in a Hebrew language, and that's what was being written on the wall. So what do you have to do? It's like you go get a translator, go get a Hebrew. So there, this hand appears, and it doesn't write in some angelic language. It writes in Hebrew. And uh, so what's another one? Uh, oh, um, is it the first or is it Dorcas first? Being interpreted, which is interpreted Tabitha. Okay, it's Dorcas first in the book of Acts, and then it translates it over for us, Tabitha. So if there is something that's needed to be translated, the Bible will do it for us. There's no mention of that here. Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So the tongue of an angel is simply describing that which is from above. All it's simply describing is the source of the information, whether it be the language of men or I'm receiving this from an angel. If I don't have love, then what about it? It's of no profit. So it's not addressing a different dialect, but the source of the information and that of revelation. So, notice also in verse 1 of chapter 13, where he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, this phrase, I am become, as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. This phrase is showing a corruption of character that is taking place. <clears throat> so for individuals to think that, well, once you're saved, you're always saved, and you're just always going to be up on this upward incline, Paul is in fact showing that if we do not have the proper aspect and view of love like God does, then we will actually be in a situation where we're going to deteriorate, not actually grow. And that's what's happening in Corinth. Okay, Corinth is starting out fine. You know, they're starting out great, but now they're all of a sudden on this downward slope. And why is that? Because you're forgetting about this element. This is used, um, let's see. Oh, you're describing this situation. Just being used and not with charity. All you're doing is just simply making a noise. Verses two and three. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so he's listing, he's playing off of these other gifts that he's mentioned in chapter 12, so that I could remove mountains. Now that's a call back to what Jesus mentioned to his apostles. You have faith of grain and mustard seed, then you'll be able to remove mountains. <clears throat> all right, if I do all of these things and I have not charity, again, Paul says, I am nothing. So this, while we're considering these points, we're looking at these and we're realizing, okay, all of these have an important part <laughs> or an important function inside of the Lord's body. And this has connection back to the works that we're involved in. The actions that we have, the things that we're going through. But what we're getting down to is the motivation as to why we're doing them. And if we're not doing these things from a position of love, then what benefit do they have? Zero. Verse three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity. Now, all of these things are good things, especially this, this last one, verse three, giving all my goods to feed the poor. I mean, that's what our buddy on Facebook is wanting to you know, throw up all the time. James chapter one, 27. Mm -hmm. caring for widows and caring for orphans okay but if you do that let's say you don't do it because of this you have the Pharisees they were doing this kind of stuff but why were they doing it alright they were saying men right, yeah. I can go to James chapter 1 verse 27 and I just do that just because the Bible says I need to do it mm. doesn't help me <laughs> so even as we're looking at us being here this morning if I'm here just because the Bible says that I need to be here or God says I need to be here and I'm not here because of this, might as well just stay home. Or in my phone. <laughs> <laughs> because notice this next phrase, it profited me nothing. <clears throat> nothing literally means zero. It's like taking a test. And you're going through this test, and you get you come you come back and you get the grade, and it's a big fat zero. You didn't get anything right. Now, usually, I mean, statistically, the probability of you going through and not getting something right is pretty slim. Now, usually, you can get lucky and at least get one or two right. But to go through to just get a zero is pretty amazing. I mean, you'd have to go through and not even try in order to get that kind of grade. But the illustration that Paul is using is that here are all of these people, and here are all the things that they're doing, trying to get a good grade, and then the grade is going to come back zero. If I do not learn to love and to grow in love, then I'm going to flunk the test. And many of our brethren, they are flunking because they don't understand this aspect of Christianity. That everything that we are doing is designed so as to help us to grow in this element. So love is a basic element. It is a more excellent way, and it is in fact superior to the miraculous gifts. So for everybody today that's still harping on and thinking that, oh, we need these miraculous gifts so to be able to keep things going, Paul is talking to a crowd that had miraculous gifts, and he is teaching them, if you do not have love, you are going to fail. So love like God loves, as we looked at and noticed on, in all those verses, in all those passages, and thus, if we are to love like God, help us to be more like God. And then when we consider that you have these different characteristics of love that Paul is going to go, go into in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, charity suffereth long. So he doesn't just give us the you know this idea of, okay, here's what you need. You need love. Well, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. Charity suffereth long. It's a variety, a variety of things in being Long-suffering. Long-suffering involves 
restraint in view of one's right to take action. So this still finds its uh, application and connection to what we're discussing with Christian liberties. Because that's what all the Christian liberties were about, too. Okay, I have this right, but I'm restraining, I'm holding back what my rights are. Why would I do that? First Corinthians chapter 8. Charity edify. Meat is good within itself, but if meat causes my brother to offend, then I will not eat meat while the world stands. Wow. Paul, what, you know, what would call him to do such a thing for somebody inside of the church? It's love and a desire to see them not stumble and go to heaven. So here's another illustration of that. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, beginning. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, until seven, until seven times, not until seven times, but until seventy times seven. What would have a person go to this degree with somebody else? It's love. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is how God is looking at us, this is how the Son of God is looking at those that are going to commit sin, repent of sin, commit sin, repent of sin. He's willing to go to that length with us. Then what about us with one another? We need to do the same thing. We should be willing to go to that length. But what a shame it is, <laughs> is that too many brethren, when it comes to the first offense, and they're ready to you know, put people down on the chopping block. Instead of having this type of reality that this is what love is striving to do. Now, I understand that as we are dealing with this and we're looking at, you know, this aspect of love suffers long. Just think back to the first Corinthians chapter five situation. All right. That doesn't seem very long suffering. But what's the problem? Why is it that in that situation we're not long suffering, but that he's saying, hey, we got to get this out of here? We never spoke up and said, hey, let's correct this wrong. Fine. Okay. They allowed it to continue. Okay. So in that situation, it's not a point or it's not a circumstance where, okay, we didn't do it here, so now we've got to go back and go through the process. No, you've already messed up, you're already way past that. You gotta get this out. Um, this is something that's going on, it's not even named among the Gentile. You should have been long suffering towards him, and that's like, okay, telling them at the first part, at the beginning, hey, you need to cut this out. You need to stop. We'll help you so as to you know be able to stop this. They didn't do any of that. So it's a situation, like we said, you skipped over it, or you're completely ignoring what it is you're supposed to be doing, and now you want to try to go back and do it. Can't do it. Or way past that. So going back to Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is then going to go through the parable or go through the illustration. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. So here's one that's transgressed. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and came it to be made. So here we have the recognition of obligation on the part of the king and on the part of the servant. You should have paid. Here's the uh, uh, right of the king. Okay, sell him, sell his children, sell his wife, so that everything is able to be, you know, be paid for. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down, worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. Suffer long with me. And I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Restraint where one had a right. And even there, we see what it was. It's compassion. Now, how many times it is the case that inside of our brotherhood, inside of congregations, that this, again, is an element that's lacking. That when a brother or sister comes and is confessing of sin and desiring to have forgiveness and seeking after repentance, they're not met with any compassion. 
but they're just met with more, you know, judgmental looks, judgmental statements, and all these different types of things. If a person comes and they are willingly repenting of something they've done wrong, then okay, we can leave the fear pointing out of it. And that's the most uncomfortable part, is where you're having to address somebody's wrongdoing and getting them to admit it. But if they come in and they are already admitting it, then the hard work, the hard part's over. Now we just get to move on to this. Okay, let's circle the wagons, let's rally up, and let's help this person. Now, as we're saying all of that, it's a very, you know, it's a very seldom situation where that actually ends up happening. <clears throat> where somebody is ready and willing to repent of wrongdoing. More times than not, it turns into a situation where, like, we've got to sit down in the meeting, we've got to have everybody here, and we've got to drag it out of you. And nobody, you know, the person's in sin and not wanting to humble themselves, not like this person here where he's saying, you know, forgive me, be patient with me, I'll try to do better. That is the kind of attitude that ends up bringing about this type of response. But yet when people come in, and they're not even willing to admit this, but they want you to deal with them this way. It's like, no, you don't get this. You don't get verse 27 until you perform verse 26. That's the key in all of this. You've got to have this attitude, and when you have this type of attitude, then we can move to this. If you're going to come in and be prideful, arrogant, and just being sick in the mud, and you're not going to change, you don't get this. Is this patience the same word in original Greek as in Second Peter five six? Second Peter one six. Six. <clears throat> do a quick search and just see. And we have that over. So we do have something in second year three nine. But uh what happened to do second Peter chapter one verse six. No, you said first Peter. I know, but then I corrected you. Yeah, so you have in 2 Peter 3 9, okay. where it is actually translated long suffering. Okay. Uh, but I can look up the one you were asking about. What was it? 2 Peter, Peter 1 7. No, so. I don't see it there. Oops. What is your son? Perseverance. So a cheerful, enduring, a patience of the patient continuance, or a patient waiting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so with this parable that Jesus is using, it represents God, the reference of the king, the servants that were underneath him, represents God and how we are under debt to him. And that being a debt of sin, which we could not, in any way, shape, or form, pay back on our own. God could act immediately. The king had every right to do that. You owe me a debt, I want you to pay it now. God could act immediately, but he had his brains. And when we're considering our rights and what it is that we think that we are owed from somebody else, this is a difficult quality to start cultivating. Now, I understand, and certainly when we're thinking about this, and we're looking at this idea of long sufferingness and that. That's what charity is. Charity suffers long. What's the danger in this? 
<clears throat> which even in this situation here, Matthew chapter 18, the danger is shown through the illustration. You can get Okay. People can take advantage of this to where they will want to play off of our long sufferingness. And all they really want to do is just play a game to where, yeah, I'm coming and I'm repenting and I'm asking for, for forgiveness, but there really is no effort for them to change. And just that whole situation of, well, I come back, I come back 70 times in a day and asking for forgiveness. But even in this context, it's not a situation where you're coming back and asking forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over again. Because if that's what's going on, then you're not really repenting if you're continuing to commit the same trend, you know, trespass against me. <clears throat> there are individuals that would want to try to take advantage of the fact that, well, love is supposed to be long-suffering. Well, that is true. But even then, long-sufferingness runs out. And it ran out with this servant here. What happens in the rest of this? He doesn't forgive the person under him. Okay. And when that happens, he doesn't get to come back and throw himself at the mercies of the king. You had that chance. And you didn't appreciate it. And in not being merciful to the person underneath you, like you had received mercy, that mercy is then taken away. So this idea that long suffering is just, it never, it's always there and it never goes away. Nah. You're not going to find that being presented in the scriptures. And even with, you know, since we brought up Peter, his writings, even Peter writes about how the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. But even then, that had a limit. 120 years, and then after that, no more long suffering. So people will try to play that game. <laughs> To where it's just like, well, you're not being long-suffering. Well, let's just roll back the clock here. And let's just see how much time, how much effort we've been trying to put in with you to have you, you know, make these changes. And we're not seeing any of these changes come to fruition. Us, yeah. 120 years would be long-suffering. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, if you don't get to, you know, you don't get to find out. At that point, and saying, "Well, be you know, be patient with me. We have been patient with you, and we're not seeing anything. Just like with this servant, you should have realized the great blessing that's been placed upon you that you've been forgiven, and then you want to turn around and take another servant by the throat. And the debt that he owes you is not even a drop in the bucket to the debt that you owe the king." And Jesus takes that as a point of illustration and saying, saying to his apostles and saying it to us today, if you are not going to forgive like your father forgives, then you're not going to be forgiven. And being able to forgive like that is, I mean, that's not something that you're born with. That is something you've got to work on. To be able to forgive like God forgives, he forgives and he forgives. <clears throat> But we have a tendency of, well, you know, I'll forget, but I'm not going to forget it. Well, then everything everything else that we're doing is for nothing. So all of this is showing also just how complex Christianity is. A lot of people want to try to present Christianity as just being this almost flat-surfaced, Cut and dry, here's the bare bones of it. No, this is complicated. And there's a lot of moving parts. And there's a lot of things for us to end up forgetting. So what do we need? Just like Peter writing to the brethren and saying, I'm writing these things to put them in your remembrance. Not that you don't know them. I know that you know them. But you need to be reminded of them. So as we said, when we're looking at the love of the Bible, Paul is going through and he's giving us the characteristics of it. But we're also going to look at in our in our next hour that if we are going to 
have love for the brethren and care and concern for the church, then there have to be uh, certain things that we're going to do so that we can truly say that we have this type of love. So we'll look at that in just a little bit. Any questions or comments or thoughts on the two verses that we looked at here? Say that you got to verse 4, 7, 13, but there are a lot of other verses to look at. Okay, everybody good? All right, short little break. The things moved over. 